All right, welcome to the extubation lecture. So this can be a very interesting time. So remember I talked about in one of the other PowerPoints how there's three phases of mechanical ventilation. There's initiation, which would be intubation. Uh, patient's unstable, they're intubated. Um, so that's that initiation. And then there's the stabilization phase where they're still sick. We're just trying to get them to a stable place so their body can heal itself be as supportive as we possibly can, avoid interventions if they're super, super sick, right? Let their body recover, let their body heal, especially if they got into respiratory fatigue. We need to let those muscles, those skeletal muscles, which the diaphragm, remember, is a skeletal muscle. So we need to let those muscles recover from the marathon that they just ran. So we need to let whatever caused them to be on the vent uh, recover. Or we need to let them heal. We need to let their body get to that stabilized phase. And then the third phase of mechanical ventilation is liberation, getting them off the ventilator. Now this can be very tenuous, very tough. And some patients, if they're on mechanical ventilation for a prolonged period of time, may not be able to come off the ventilator while they're at the acute care hospital. They might have to go to a long-term acute care hospital um, where they would be on a vent over there after they're trached uh, because their muscles were so fatigued, because there was so much atrophy that went on with their prolonged mechanical ventilation because they were sick and they could not use their diaphragm. They had that mus muscular atrophy. They ended up having to be on long-term ventilation and, until those muscles can build themselves up to get themselves off. So we had a patient who uh, severe ARDS. He was ejected from a vehicle through a windshield uh, off of a bypass and he broke er almost everything in his body and his body was in a massive amount of inflammation, broken bones, he had to be paralyzed. Um, obviously heavy sedation whenever you paralyze a patient and obviously his diaphragm and all of his respiratory muscles atrophied and the thing about the diaphragm it is skeletal muscle but with that skeletal muscle you lose one percent a day of its function and so he was on mechanical ventilation for at least three weeks where he was paralyzed so that's no use of that muscle so severe significant atrophy and to get him to wean off the ventilator was something that we couldn't do because it's going to take a long time for him to build up that strength. Even when he's stable and trached and everything, he's still going to take a long time to build up that strength to wean and extubate. So that muscular atrophy is one of the things that we're worried about. So we'll even wean a patient, which means let them breathe on their own through the ventilator without thinking about extubating them if they're still if they're stable enough to wean but not stable enough to extubate like let's say they're going back in for surgery or so on and so forth and they're not paralyzed we're going to try to do the weans just to keep that muscle strong enough after it's recovered from that initial injury so that's the big thing if the muscle's fatigued let it recover once it's recovered start using it again or else you'll lose it right if you don't use a muscle you'll lose it, right? So that's the same thing with the diaphragm and the respiratory uh, accessory muscles as well. We need to let them use those muscles. And then if they're stable enough to try and extubate, give them a shot, right? We owe it to them. If they show all the parameters and they um, have met the criteria where they're stable enough to extubate, we do it. Even if we think there's a chance they may not make it, we owe it to them to try to do it. We don't want to keep someone on a mechanical ventilator longer than they need to be. So let's get into this a little bit. So an overview, indications for extubation. Uh, they don't need airway management. So let's say someone had um, uh, severe alcohol poisoning. Uh, let's just go there. Uh, severe alcohol poisoning, uh, obtunded, unable to protect the airway, no cough, no gag reflex. So they were intubated to protect their airway, right? That's one of the indications for intubation. Uh, and now they've gone through withdrawal, or they've gone through their uh, stabilization phase, they've gotten their reflexes back. Uh, so that might be an indication to go ahead and extubate that patient. They can cough, they can gag, they have those processes. Uh, whatever required their intubation was reversed. So high oxygen requirements, let's say they were on a non-breathing mask at 15 liters a minute and you know they were still having troubles or they were on high flow at 70 liters a minute or they were 
a non-invasive ventilation and their blood gases were still looking poor. So now they're on a ventilator and they're on 30% or 40% oxygen and six of CPAP, right? Six of PEEP is what we call it when they're on the ventilator. So their oxygen requirements have gotten better. They don't require near as much pressure, near as much FiO2. If their x-rays are looking better, if their secretions are reduced, right? If they're no longer in their, they're past their septic stage, right? So whatever required them to get intubate, intubated uh, is pretty much reversed. Uh, their pneumonia has uh, shown signs of resolving on x-ray, so on and so forth. Right? These are all things that we'll look at. So if those things are reversed and they're on the upswing and then we owe it to them to take it out. Uh, obstruction of the ET tube, this isn't where the patient is stable. This is where the patient has a giant mucus plug that gets stuck in the ET tube. So that's something where we would look at you and you cannot dislodge it if there's some reason uh, a plug, whether it's a blood clot, if they were a burn victim or a uh, trauma victim or a uh, mucus plug, if it cannot be dislodged, then you have to remove and extubate. Uh, so you might have to extubate and then emergently re-intubate that patient. Um, those are always unique times. Uh, I remember a trach patient where uh, his he had a ball valve effect where there was a piece of... Um, mucus sticking at the end of his trach down there and it, the breath would be delivered it would push the little piece of mucus out of the way but it would work like a one-way valve it would close off when he would try to exhale so he got very unstable very quickly and i'm like oh it's a ball valve effect so he might have a pneumothorax pretty easily so i actually dropped the cuff on the trach because uh, he was on the vent uh, we got the doctor in there I dropped the cuff on the trach so that way gas could get out around through his upper airway so we could still let gas out too to avoid a pneumothorax and then see what the doctor wanted to do from there because the thing was if I pulled the trach we might have he had, it was a pretty fresh trach he might have had an anoxic injury and so on so you'll have different situations here and they come with practice they come with evaluation this is why I want you guys to be thinkers what would happen if what would I do if this would happen? What would I do if that would happen, right? So you can't be just per a person that goes from room to room to room charting numbers without thinking about what would I do if this happened? So uh, that's always something that I want you guys to be thinking about. What would I do if this happened? And then ask your preceptors, ask your teachers, ask the people at the hospital, hey, have you ever seen this, right? A pulmonologist so-and-so, have you ever seen this, right? So what would you do recommend if you ever seen this type of thing, right? So these, this is you being a continual student way past your time here at Pima. So obstruction of the ET tube, uh, obviously you then reintubate a uh, patient capable of maintaining their airway. So let's say this is a stroke victim that now has good cough, good gag. Uh, they are able to, um, they still might be on swallow precautions for a little while, but uh, they're able to actually maintain their airway and keep it open. Those are all things that we look at. Uh, contraindications. Uh, I might underline this if I was you. I don't know if you have an ability to underline, but there are no absolute contraindications. Um, you just usually try to make sure the patient's ready. Uh, and it doesn't mean we think there's a 100% chance of success before we extubate. I had patients where we would extubate and they would still have a lot of oxygen requirements. They'd be on 80% and 10 of CPAP, which on a ventilator is called 10 of PEEP. And they'd be on a lot of oxygen, a lot of PEEP. And normally people would be like, well, that's too much. Their requirements are high. They're not reversed. They don't meet that liberation phase. But because of everything going else with the patient, I felt very comfortable. Me and the physician, right? The physician was like, well, even though this is there, well, what are your thoughts on extubation? I'm like, let's give it a shot because... That could be easily be something we could take care of non-invasively, and we don't. The side effects of mechanical ventilation uh, were such that we could easily mimic the oxygen requirements with a heated high flow and other things. So it's something that you're going to have to look at. There's no absolute contraindications to extubation. Let's say a patient doesn't have a cough or a gag reflex. It doesn't mean we can't extubate them. 
right? It doesn't mean we can't. We can't. That just means that they just currently don't have one, and their ability to protect their airway is questionable. But that's something that we might not be able to assess until all the sedation's off, until we get all that stuff there. So there's a gray area here. I know you guys love gray areas, but there are no absolute contraindications. We just need to make sure that the the t patient care team is ready if there's some of those special gray situations going on uh, to emergently reintubate or urgently reintubate if we need to, but we just need to look at the whole situation, not just do they check all the boxes. It's not a do they check all the boxes situation. They may check a couple boxes off and look stable enough. Let's give them a shot because we don't want the risk of mechanical ventilation to outweigh the benefits of being off of it uh, when it comes to the situation. You leave too many people on for too long, you expose them to a lot of different situations. So we can always go into the side effects of mechanical ventilation down the road, but extubation is something where they're start starting to meet the parameters for it, then we might go ahead and be on the aggressive side. And it's always good to be on the aggressive side here. Of extubating those patients even though it's not comfortable it's always good to be on the aggressive side if the patient has deemed it where they've earned the right to do an extubation trial then we do it right and we'll go into that here uh, complications of extubation of course hypoxia especially if the airway closes off for some reason or another we had a patient and I told you guys that they had a stroke and it was towards the back of their brain stem uh, in the pons area that I believe that controls the um, area that will uh, that controls your airway muscle muscles so your glossopharyngeal muscles um, so what happened when we extubated the stroke victim, everything else looked fine. They were breathing spontaneously on their own through the ventilator. Everything looked great. We extubated and their airway just collapsed. Um, and so we had an issue because the airway collapsed and they couldn't breathe. It was like an obstructive sleep apnea, like an obstructive apnea. And so we had to reintubate. So hypoxia can be an issue, especially if there's something like that that goes on. Uh, they're no longer getting as much positive pressure directly to their airway, uh, directly to their lungs, I should say. We can always put them on CPAP. When we extubate, we can extubate to non-invasive. That is an option, not one that's very popular, but that is an option. Laryngospasm, bronchospasm can easily happen, uh, especially when the balloon isn't deflated. So you need to make sure your cuff's deflated when you're extubating. If that cuff's not deflated, if that cuff is not deflated, and you're trying to extubate this patient, right? You're pulling out the tube, the tube's trying to go out. Uh, then if that cuff is not deflated, and here's your vocal cords here, then the balloon is just going to scrape and, and damage and cause trauma to that airway. So it's going to be one of those very uh, traumatic things where they can go into laryngospasm or bronchospasm because of the irritation uh, of the extubation procedure. So one of the things that we'll have to have ready is racemic epinephrine. So racemic epinephrine uh, is something that helps vasoconstrict, right? This is the epinephrine part of it. So if we nebulize it to their airway, that will vasoconstrict the blood vessels in their airway, which will then reduce edema from a trauma or from a narrowed airway. So once we reduce the edema, that means the airway is going to get larger in diameter. Of course, Posey's law takes effect. The larger the diameter of the airway, the more the less air resistance there is, which means uh, they can breathe more comfortably and less work of breathing, which is important. So racemic epinephrine is a great thing to have on hand. Uh, some places would put patients that are at high risk for the airways to be swollen on cool aerosol masks. So you're looking at that face tent of like just cool aerosol, not heated uh, aerosol, but just cool bland aerosol therapy to help with that as well. Uh, hypercapnia, especially if they if their uh, respiratory muscles go into fatigue early after extubation, can be a thing as well. So hypercapnia, uh, and you'll notice this by their level of consciousness. You'll maybe look at their work of breathing. You'll draw blood gas, like the, you'll put an end tidal CO2 on them, like a nasal cannula, and you'll see that they're they're developing that. So a, make sure the cuff's deflated, and b, just understand that these things can easily happen and have a plan for it. 
you usually extubate them to, let's say, four liters of nasal cannula, or you'll extubate them to non-invasive if, if um, they're a little bit more unstable with their requirements while they're weaning. But that's something that you just need to be prepared for as well. And then never stand directly in front of a patient when you're extubating, uh, especially. Uh, make sure you suction out their airway pretty pretty well too. There's a lot of oral secretions that tend to just build up on the top of that cuff there. So something to look at there. Uh, three key points for weaning. The problem that caused the patient to require ventilation should be resolved. Certain measurable criteria should be established to see that they're ready to come off the ventilator. So in other words, they have to breathe for a half hour or an hour spontaneously on the ventilator. That means the ventilator is not doing the bulk of the work. The patient's doing the bulk of the work and they look comfortable. Their heart rate didn't go up. Their blood pressure didn't go up or down, right? Everything's looking comfortable. They can respond to commands and that's not always a requirement, but we're looking at all these things seeing if is the patient ready, right? So that's that spontaneous breathing trial, right? Are they ready to breathe on their own? So let's let the ventilator just give them some oxygen, a little bit of pressure to help overcome breathing through a straw. And we'll see how they do. If they do really well, then everything else is trending in the right direction. We may give it a shot, right? Unless they're going back to surgery that in that day or something like that. Right? There are always little exceptions here and there. So Weaning criteria, they should maintain adequate oxygenation, they shouldn't get hypercarbic, uh, their pH should still be within that normal range, so if we draw blood gas at the end of the wean, we should still see that they didn't have compromise during the wean. A NIF, so negative inspiratory force or maximum inspiratory pressure according to NBRC World. Uh, should be greater than negative 30. Um, some ventilators, some hospitals may require you to do a NIF, especially if you're looking at someone with muscle weakness like a spinal cord injury patient or a neuromuscular uh, disease uh, like ALS or um, disorder like ALS. Um, so those are just some examples of where they might look at more muscle things. They might require you to get a NIF and or a VC. A vital capacity, you'll have the patient take a deep breath in and blow out as hard as they can. That's, and then you're gonna look at your tidal volume readout of your exhaled tidal volume on the ventilator to see how much volume they exhaled, so that would be a VC. Some vents actually have a vital capacity in, uh, they have a NIF and a VC in there. I know the, the Covidian vents have that too. So just be sure if this is something in there, your vent actually might have something in there that measures these two things. Otherwise, you might have to pop them off for a NIF and then you have, might have to just use the good old spontaneous for the vital capacity. So the vital capacity should be over 10 mils per kilo of ideal body weight. Uh, so that means if they're a morbidly obese patient, we're not going to go by actual body weight, right? Just like our tidal volumes would go by ideal or predicted body weight. So a NIF should be greater than negative 30, so you want like 32, 35, 37. If the NIF is 10, right, that's a sign that their respiratory muscles may be poor. <laughs> and so that could be an indication that they might not have the muscle strength needed to spontaneous. The respiratory rate should be less than 35. They should not be tachypneic. So less than 35 is considered acceptable. Um, uh, for this type of situation. So if they get where they're breathing in the 40s on their wean, that's a sign that they're in respiratory uh, distress, they're tachypneic, and that's not something we'll look at. All right, the RSBI, Rapid Shallow Breathing Index, should be, in theory be less than 105. Okay, so this is your frequency over your tidal volume. So the respiratory rate over their tidal volume. We're going to divide it, and it should be less than 105. So this is looking at literally rapid, shallow breathing. So if it's greater than 105, that means they're breathing really fast and they're breathing really shallow, which are not life-sustaining. That means their lungs are not, or their respiratory muscles are not ready to come off yet. Because remember, as your lungs get lower and lower in compliance, you're going to breathe faster and faster because you can't breathe as deep, right? The stiffer your lungs, you can't expand them as much, so you have to breathe faster to compensate. So that's what this is looking at. Are they breathing really fast and really shallow on their own? Are, is their lung compliance resolved 
enough to where they can breathe effectively on their own. Well, clearly, if it's greater than 105, that might be a sign that that's not true. Now, have I extubated people with RSBIs greater than 105? Yes, right? So this is something that we're going to look at as a whole patient picture, right? It's not like you have to check every single one of these boxes. I keep on underlying that, right? So an RSBI should be less than 105 in theory in the perfect world. So it's respiratory rate over tidal volume. And I may ask you to calculate that. Yay. Uh, patients alert and oriented, uh, obviously asterisk here because just like grammar, there's an exception almost everywhere. Uh, when you're looking at a patient that's alert and oriented, that's great. They can follow commands, that's great. Sometimes the only command that they might be able to give you uh, is uh, show me the bird <laughs> right so they might be a little angry especially because something's stuck in their trachea uh, so you might have some of those uncomfortable patients now hopefully none of your pediatric patients are doing that type of thing but alert and oriented is going to be one of our things uh, just because a patient is not alert and oriented does not mean we cannot extubate them so like i said great area here in the world's most perfect situation we're checking all of these boxes. However, remember this can change from patient to patient. Uh, stroke victims, right? I've extubated stroke victims where they were not alert and oriented. They were not responding, right? Or, or um, neuro injuries that were not responsive in that direction. And then they, they ended up doing just fine, right? So that's something that we have to look at. Adequate cough to maintain secretions. Yeah, they should be able to cough or have a cough reflex. Um, to manage their secretions, especially when you start extubating and taking someone off of positive pressure. Well, what happens to the cilia when you take someone off of positive pressure? Hey, they wake up again, because remember, positive pressure stuns the cilia. So your mucociliar escalator now wakes up. Now you can move all those secretions that were jammed deep, deep inside your lungs. So now you can clear that out. So getting those secretions out is going to be one of the big things there. And so they need to be able to cough. They need to be able to clear the secretions. Well, let's say they're a spinal cord injury patient or a neuromuscular patient. That's when you'd have to use your cough assist. You have to use things like that that would help them clear the situation. So if I had a SMI patient or um, ALS patient, uh, it doesn't mean I can't extubate them because they don't have an adequate cough. They already don't have an adequate cough, but we have machines that can help with that, right? So that's something that you would have to look at case by case. Uh, cuff leak test, <laughs> of course. So a cuff leak test means uh, the patient's still on the ventilator and we have pressure or volume going into the patient, right? So they're not on a wean, they're on their regular vent settings and we've suctioned out their oral airway, we've suctioned out their oral pharynx pretty darn well uh, and then we're going to take the cuff down. So a cuff leak test means I'm going to deflate the cuff of the ET tube and I'm going to listen with my stethoscope on their trachea uh, to hear if there's any air passing through or see on my ventilator if their tidal volumes get lower or their pressures get lower. Uh, I should hear and or see uh, some leaking around the ET tube. In other words, there shouldn't be as much pressure, shouldn't be as much volume. I should hear it with my stethoscope that air is going past the tube. That's a sign that the throat uh, or the trachea is not swollen around the ET tube, okay? So that means if we extubate, then that's a good sign that we won't have a swollen airway that shuts off completely, right? That the patient could still ventilate or have a patent airway after we extubate. Here's the thing, a cuff leak test. Um, it does not mean if you do not have a cuff leak, it does not mean that you cannot extubate. Uh, let's say we have a, an adult female that's five foot three, and so so an average to smaller size, right, somewhere in that range of an adult female. Let's say they put an eight and a half tube in her. Well, an eight and a half tube is way too big for someone that size, and will she have a cuff leak? Probably not, right? Probably very hard to simulate a cuff leak on her. So. Would that preclude her from extubation? Absolutely not, right? We just have to be aware that might be some more tracheal trauma. We have to have our cool aerosol. We're seeming epinephrine. Like we have to be ready for some some of this situation. Uh, Heliox was also another option here. However, the evidence behind Heliox uh, 
as far as any evidence beyond Heliox goes, is usually related to the late 80s, early 90s. So a lot of the Heliox um, studies are a little dusty, so they may not use Heliox as much for those types of patients anymore. Usually we'll put the ventilator on uh, CPAPA5 or PIPA5 and a press sporta 5. Now this can change from hospital to hospital, uh, and this is just an example here. So that means that they're using a pressure of 5 just to help get that gas through the, e the ET tube, and then whenever they trigger a breath on their own, they're just going to give them a little bit of IPAP, a little bit of pressure support, a little bit of delta P here, just to help overcome the raw of breathing through the tube. So it's not enough that it would deliver a full, complete breath. It's just enough that it would help overcome the raw of breathing through a tube. So that's fair, right? We're giving them a little something just to help overcome breathing through a straw. Usually the, fit, the FiO2 should be less than 0.5, and then sometimes we want to make sure they wean for a good half hour to an hour or so. So this is just an example of what we would sort of do for that, so you sort of see that. Weaning to estimate uh, extubation, so if we, we could wean without extubating someone, um, like I said, just to help the muscles sort of develop and avoid atrophy um, overall. When we're willing to extubate, we just need to make sure that they're uh, closely monitored. You're not just going to put them in a wean and walk out of the room because they can go into respiratory and or cardiac distress very, very, very easily. So the patient should not be allowed to experience extreme exhaustion during the trial because then that will set you back and the patient will spend even longer on the ventilator again trying to recover. So this doesn't mean you put them on and go take a breakfast, right? This means you put them on, you stay in the room, you're in, in there with the patient for at least usually 15 minutes just to make sure they're flying, make sure they're doing well. Unnecessary prolonged of a failed uh, spontaneous breathing trial can lead to muscle fatigue. Their heart could start going into a tachycardia, especially if they're a CHF patient, which remember, 50% of your COPD years have CHF. So they can easily, without the positive pressure, go into heart failure as well. Uh, so that's something that you'll have to pay attention to. Without that positive pressure, their heart will expand, which means when it expands, according to Sterling's law, it's going to have to work harder or has more movement when it has to squeeze, which means the myocardium is going to have to work harder Again, which means if the myocardium is not healthy enough, then they could go into cardiac instability, right? They could, their blood pressure could drop, they can go into cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now you're looking at spending even longer on the ventilator just because you weren't there. Uh, they could obviously be very uncomfortable during this whole thing. Their gas exchange could be very, very poor. So you should be aware with signs and symptoms during a spontaneous breathing trial. You'll see this box on the bottom. Pull this directly from your book, so you should be aware of things. Uh, findings provide evidence that some underlying problem is preventing a successful wean. Uh, so patients who are not tolerating the process usually show signs of dyspnea, like they're working hard. Their, um, you see accessory muscles, you see their abdomen moving hard. Babies, you'll see the retractions and nasal flaring. You'll see just fatigue, diaphoresis. Sometimes they're in pain and they're in too much pain. So when you're in pain, what, what do you do with your breathing? What, what is your fight or flight systems kicked in, right? You have your pain response going on. You have your fight, flight, or freeze system going on and you're working hard and you're in pain. You're breathing fast, you're breathing hard. So that could easily be a sign that they're not quite ready because their pain control is a little under under um, uh, under treated. Uh, anxiety, of course, um, that can be a big thing because now you're trying to tell them something, there's this tube stuck in their trachea, um, and then they can't understand hardly anything. They're in the sort of days with all the sedation drugs that have been on board. It's a very weird mental and neurological time for that patient. So that's something you just gotta be aware of. They're just not gonna be in their normal mental state usually. Sweating, of course, uh, pallor cyanosis, these are all bad signs. <laughs> uh, drowsiness, of course, especially with the types of drugs that they're using, and then restlessness, that's just a very common thing, especially when we take all their sedation off, a sedation vacation, or across the pond, the sedation holiday, uh, they uh, um, might not like too much having a tube stuck in their throat, their hands tied down, 
right? And then people talking to them and they don't understand what's going on. They don't understand where they're at. It's like a bad nightmare to them in a lot of cases. So I could understand the restlessness and the anxiety and all those things going on. Uh, if they're using accessory muscles, that's also a sign that they're not ready to quite come off yet. So as calm as the patient is, so when I would go into the patient's room to wean them, my most successful times of weaning weren't waking the patient up and saying, good morning, how are you? And tell the nurse, let's take all the sedation off and let's do all this. If the sedation's on, and most of the time nowadays, we're using very low or light levels of sedation. Um, so this is something you communicate with the nurse. Hey, what, what's their current level? What's their RAS score? And we'll talk about a RAS score later on in pharmacology. But what's the current RAS score? If it's close to zero, then that's a good sign. Um, zero or a positive one. Um, that means the patient's pretty awake. That means they're using pretty low uh, sedation levels. Good. This is good. That means that I, I can go in there and gently put them into a wean and their respiratory drive is not suppressed and I don't have to tell them everything and get them anxious and be like, what procedure is doing on this? I would just go in there, do write down my numbers, and then I would do my assessment and then I would go ahead and start the wean, right? If the patient's flying, great. But that's something that I would do without trying to cause anxiety and fatigue stuff. Um, these are all the acceptable values and of course <sighs> yes you will be responsible for this. I can hear the I can feel the joy of all of you right now. Uh, these, <laughs> um, your PF ratio should be greater than 250. That's one of the big things that's out there. Um, your shunting should be less than 20%. Uh, hopefully it's less than 30% overall. Remember that's a critical value. Your vital capacity should be around 10 to 15, right? That one says 15. Um, minute ventilation shouldn't be super high. If they have a minute ventilation of 18, that's way too high for them to maintain on their own. So minute ventilation of adult 10 to 15. Tidal volume, anywhere between four and six mils per kilo, even though that sounds shallow, it is, but they, they meet parameters. So it should be around five mils per kilo. Respiratory rate, remember, it has to be less than 35 or frequency. RSPI, hopefully less than 105. Um, ventilatory parameters, uh, so they should be stable. They should have good muscle strength. That's what the NIF is. The P100, I won't test you on. That's how strong the muscles are that drive to breathe. It's from the brain. Uh, some vents actually do a P100, which is kind of cool. Uh, estimation of work of breathing. There's a work of breathing index. I won't make you guys do that. Um, oxygen cost of breathing. I will make you guys do that. Compliance greater than 25. Always good to remember, right? Really stiff lungs aren't going to breathe really well on their own. Uh, VDVT, you do need to know this one. Uh, 0.6 is going to be your critical value there. Crop index, I will not make you guys memorize that one. P2 on 40 greater uh, less than 40 percent should be above 60. That means that we might we will have a good chance of oxygenating when we extubate. PEEP 5 to 8, so very minimal level of CPAP or PEEP. All right, when a ventilator is involved, it's called PEEP. Uh, and I already talked to the PF ratio. So the, I've highlighted the ones that I sort of want you to know and ones that I won't stress as much. Uh, assessment of needs going to be your big thing for extubation. Usually we do it at least Q uh, AM or Q shift, uh, depending on the hospital. Uh, so this doesn't mean that we can't extubate someone at one in the morning. Let's say someone comes out of heart surgery at an emergency heart surgery at 10 o'clock at night. That doesn't mean we keep them on on purpose until the morning and then look at extubating them. If they're stable enough later that evening or at one in the morning, then to extubate, then we extubate, right? Because there is risks associated with prolonged mechanical ventilation. Typically, a spontaneous breathing try will last around 30 minutes to an hour. Usually, we don't let, let it go any longer than 120 minutes. Uh, these would be the patients that were um, weaning, but they were not ready to extubate. We're just trying to make sure that muscle is good and strong. So the current evidence or the best evidence out there is to wean BID uh, if you're not going to extubate. So you would do 120 minutes or 90 minutes. 
uh, BID just to help keep the respiratory muscles um, strong or from atrophying if we're not going to extubate. If there's some reason we're keeping them on, uh, so that's something that we would do. Uh, weaning criteria has been met prior to extubation. We're going to look at all the meds to determine if they're extubate. Uh, Make sure they're off of their uh, sedation. <laughs> Make sure there's no paralytics on board. Make sure there's nothing that would really hinder them from breathing uh, on board, especially with their medicines. Um, so that's one of the things that you have to look at. We've had people get extubated on uh, Dipravan, which is the classically known as the Michael Jackson drug. Uh, for some of you, you may understand that whole situation uh, too soon. So when you're looking at this, uh, that if that drug's still on board, it can suppress in higher levels, it can suppress the drive to breathe. Hence, that's why Michael Jackson went into a respiratory cardiac arrest, right? Too much of that drug in his system caused him to go into that uh, respiratory and cardiac arrest. So when we're looking at this, are they still on a level of sedation that could impede the respiratory drive? Now, there's things out there like, like Presidex, which I loved Presidex. Of course, pharmacy didn't like it because it cost more than Diprovan. Um, but they can be, be extubated. They can be on BiPAP. They can, uh, little kids, I had a three-year-old on non-invasive uh, that was on Presidex. So um, there are drugs they can be on and when to extubate as well. So just make sure when you're looking at this, is there a drug, uh, is there some reason why, uh, is there something still on board that should not be on board of that patient's system when we extubate? Uh, you don't want to be the one that pulls the tube and they're still on light dose of paralytics and or Dipper van and all that stuff. So look at their labs, make sure they're not trending in the wrong direction, make sure they're not developing an infection. So look at their white blood cells, uh, their eyes and nose, make sure they're not retaining fluids, all that stuff. So this is where your whole patient assessment comes into play. So you need to know their need isn't resolved, and that's when we're going to look at, okay, now we can probably extubate. Cuff leak test means the testing for post extubation error patency. We already talked about that one. Patients disconnected from the ventilator or cuffs deflated. Um, the tube is obstructed in theory. We should hear a leak around the cuff. Um, so it's not usually classically done this way. This is how uh, the book wants you to know it. Uh, and that's in theory how I want you to know it. Uh, however, usually we avoid disconnecting them from the ventilator if we can. So uh, when we're doing this, we're usually having the patient still on mechanical ventilation. Uh, we suction out the airway and then we drop the cuff and then we listen for air passing through uh, around the sides of the tube. So by doing the classic way that's on your screen here, you're actually able to know that they can breathe around that tube. So like I said, I don't put a lot of oomph or a lot of clout behind this because what if they do have an appropriately sized ED tube in, right? So it's not something that I'm going to strain myself as far as making sure that I disconnect them from the ventilator and I do all this part, there's a lot of risks associated every time you break the ventilator circuit of the patient getting an infection. So that's something that if we can leave everything connected, we do. Um, so we'll go into that more mechanical ventilation. So successful extubation is usually pretty darn secure. If they have good strong cough, they don't have a lot of secretions, uh, there is a cuff leak. So that's something that we'll look at there. And that's just, hey, the good chances, right? Doesn't mean that every time you do it with those boxes, check that it will be perfect. Uh, they may go into fatigue still. A couple hours later, they might go into fatigue, you might have to reintubate, right? Um, so a leak test of a very small leak test, like 110 mLs, uh, indicates a high risk of strider. So then that doesn't mean you can't extubate, it just means we might need to get something on board like steroids or racemic epinephrine or both before we extubate, right? Make sure that cool aerosol, if they still do the heliox, then that would be something you could do. Um, but as far as evidence base goes, right, you're just gonna have to check with your facility on their protocol. But as far as evidence base goes, racemic epinephrine and cool aerosol might be better options there. 
right? It does not guarantee post-extubation difficulties will arise. I've extubated so many patients that did not have a cuff leak, and we were just ready to go in case something happened. So we would put the bougie in through the airway, and we would extubate over the bougie, and the bougie would still be in the trachea. So if they were in respiratory difficulty, then we would just slide a new ET tube over the bougie, back into the airway, and restart to vent hook them back up to mechanical ventilation so it doesn't mean you can't extubate right you just need to make sure you communicate with the care team about the plans and what we're going to do so this is what i'm seeing this is what we're looking at uh we also need to know is the patient plan to go back to surgery today uh are they going to go to ct mri cat scan ir so on and so forth right should we be pulling a tube for them just to put a tube back in later on within 24 hours, right? Or can those procedures be moved up, right? Things like that. We'll have to look at uh, sedation level. I already talked to you guys about that with the RASS, R-A-S-S. Um, please look that up. Please don't wait till advanced arm to look that up. Uh, that's something in your IC rotation that will serve you well is looking up what a RASS score is and what it means to weaning. Uh, so RASS. R-A-S-S. -S. Look that up, please. Uh, Post-extubation plans. Hey, we extubate the patient. Are we going to put them on non-invasive? Most ICU ventilators nowadays have a non-invasive mode, so you just go get a mask and a blue elbow, and you would be able to just put them in non-invasive right away. Uh, are you going to put them on high flow? Right. Let's say they're a COPD -er and we're going just to put them on high flow when we extubate, just to help with some of that CO2, just to help them flush out some of that CO2 to reduce that. Do they need a sitter? Do we need to secure someone in there for like a CWAP protocol, a, a neuro patient? Uh, type situation do we need to go get extra staff for when we pull this tube uh, anxiety is that is there something if we've seen anxiety on their sedation vacations is there a, a medication plan to help control their anxiety uh, make sure that their tube feeds are stopped uh, more common in the pediatric population but if we have to reintubate do you want a stomach full of stuff when you're trying to bag a patient no, because you can back pressure it and they can aspirate and cause an aspiration pneumonia, which is a high risk of ARDS, which then could increase their mortality, right? If a patient was a difficult airway for the intubation, that's why you should look at the notes. Uh, make sure you're ready to go, whether it's heliox or video intubation uh, scope. Those things are available if you have to reintubate. Uh, if they're a really high risk of, of reintubation or they were very hard intubation, let's say they had a lot of trauma with their intubation, uh, trauma anesthesia. Or anesthesia that should be available that's very good with managing an intubation airway. Uh, cry kit, that's the more common if you uh, if you really think you cannot get that airway. But uh, this is something you just have a plan, right? Have a plan. Uh, equipment that you need to extubate suction, of course, suction the oral airway. So oral um, pharynx, um, that is one thing that, that all those secretions in the oral pharynx, when you drop that cuff, can easily just drop their way into the lungs and then yeah now you're looking at them aspirating a ton of uh oral secretions that's not good right that's not a good way to start off that's not giving them a hand up uh on having success oxygen aerosol equipment so nasal cannula is ready to go or high flow is ready to go or non-invasive uh, some hospitals make you put cool aerosol on, so just be aware. Nebulizer with semic epinephrine, you should just have that available. It doesn't mean for every excavation we're going to take it in the room with us. We should just know that, hey, over there in the Pixis machine, 20 feet away, there is racemic epinephrine and 20 feet away there's also a small volume nebulizer that i can use to nebulize to this patient so we know and have it available a syringe of course to deflate the cup the et tube towels put this over their chest don't make a mess it's one of the easiest ways to get on the nurse's uh bad side is to make a mess right so something to put on their chest so you extubate you can put all that gooey tubes uh, into this uh, towel and throw the tubes away and throw the towel in the laundry or chuck or you just chuck it all away uh, but yeah don't make a mess uh, scissors more for if you have to cut tape or anything like that um, self-inflation bag of masks right you always have a backup ventilator no matter what um, in case something goes wrong you need to uh, reintubate or bag them you need to have that available uh, so all this equipment should be uh, ready for intubation. 
uh, all the equipment that you use to intubate should be available. Doesn't mean it needs to be in the room, open, and ready to go. It just needs to be available readily if something were to happen. So there should be an airway box or an airway cart or a code cart that has the, all the stuff in there. Somewhere around the vicinity that could be readily accessed. Um, adhesive remover, I love these. Uh, working NICU so much. This is what we use to avoid tearing skin when you're taking these tube holders or tape off of the patient. Uh, so it's great to get all that stuff off of their skin without tearing skin. So I used it especially for your generationally advanced individuals. Uh, their skin can be very delicate and paper-like so just be gentle. Like if this was you, would you want someone just putting duct tape on your face and then ripping it off? Well, no, this is not a waxing parlor, right? So this is why I'm like, I was always a big fan of the adhesive remover for this type of thing. Of course, it's stethoscope. Not only is it very fashionable, but it comes in handy when you're listening for strider. So the first place you listen when you intubate should be the stomach for gastric sounds and then bilateral lungs. Well, the first place you listen when you extubate should be the trachea, right, for strider and things like that. So you will need a stethoscope. You need to make sure they're on monitor so you can look at their EKG, see if their heart is tolerating it, blood pressure, right? Make sure they're hemodynamically tolerating this extubation. Make sure that their stats are being um, stable as well. The procedure, get all the equipment. Suction down the tube, so anything that's around the cuff, so anything that's inside the tube. Pre-oxygenate, of course, right? Because uh, it'll be a delay between the extubation and putting something on. Uh, so pre-oxygenate, uh, remove the tape or securing device, deflate the cuff, remove the ET tube. Now let me ask you this. Do you extubate with them coughing? Do you extubate with them at the end of an inhale? Do you extubate at the end of an exhale? Hopefully you said at the end of an inhale. So you have the patient inhale really deep. And at the end of the inhale, pull the tube. They're naturally going to cough as you pull the tube out. It's that irritation reflex, right? This is, this is anatomy and physiology. They're going to have irritation of their trachea and their vocal cords naturally when you pull the tube. So forcing them to cough squeezes their airway, squeezes their pharynx around the tube, and therefore when you're pulling it out while it's being squeezed, it will cause trauma and more likely to have strider. Extubation, your airway, uh, exhalation, your airway is smaller, so they're more likely to rub against the airway and cause trauma. So end inhale would be the optimal time of the extubation. Uh, have them de deep breath in and inhale, pull that tube out. The airway is as patent as it can be. So are the vocal cords less chance at rubbing against anything and then they'll naturally cough as a response. But hopefully the tube's out of there by the time that. So remove the ET tube, apply uh, whatever type of device you're going to keep them oxygenated with and of course you're going to stay in the room you don't just extubate and walk away right this is not a drive-by rt thing <laughs> you're going to be in the room uh, assess the patient make sure they're breathing okay chart everything under the plan uh because this is a big thing hey patient was extubated this person was in the room this is what their respiratory rate sat pulse ox is doing no work of breathing noted uh, so on and so forth. RT will evaluate and treat as needed, right? Uh, so please watch these videos. Big thing is watching out for Strider. If you start to see work of breathing or Strider, uh, CPAP. <laughs> That's one of my big things. CPAP. Uh, CPAP, if you can, uh, do it and then and or racemic epinephrine. You can always do racemic epinephrine through a CPAP machine, just saying. Um, so I loved CPAP because what does CPAP do to the airway, especially thinking about obstructive sleep apnea patients, right? It distends and keeps the airway patent. So that's what I'm looking for a lot of times there is I need to stent open the airway to help them breathe a little bit. I need that pressure. So um, so frontline treatment for Strider, uh, what else will help Strider, right? So we're looking at things like racemic epinephrine, positive pressure, and or Heliox are there some of the big things that we'd be looking at there. Uh, if we can't get them sort of stabilized with that, then we might have to urgently or emergently reintubate them. Um, all right. So when you're looking at the YouTube video, you have 
fun with those. There's lots of them out there. Uh, big thing after you're, <laughs> you're extubating, when you're doing the extubation procedure, don't keep them in the dark. Now, I said weaning was one thing, right? Extubation is another thing. You're going to tell them what's going to happen. Tell them that their voice uh, may not be back right away. They might have a hoarse voice. Some of them talk perfectly normal. Great. Some of them, it's going to take a while. Please don't use your voice too much when we extubate. Right. Uh, and then you tell someone that, and they're going to do the exact opposite. So have fun with that. Uh, tell your patient what you're doing. Uh, while you're doing it, no. I usually tell them what they do before I do it. Okay, I'm Derek, and with respiratory care, and I'm going to take this tube out of your throat, and I'm going to have you take a couple of deep breaths. I'm going to suction the back of your mouth. Get some of the saliva, just like at the dentist, and then we're going to have a big breath, and I'm going to take that out, and I'm going to get take all this stuff off of your face. So I usually tell before, not while, right? Uh, uh, that's why I have that sort of in there, sort of like, gotcha, right? You tell them before you're going to do it, so that just sort of prepares them mentally for what's going to go on. Common problems, sore throat, of course, uh, cough. Uh, laryngospasm. Uh, this is more rare, uh, rare. It can't happen, but it's usually because they were at uh, they were had a Valsalva maneuver. Like you told them to cough while you were extubating, and it can actually go into a laryngospasm and or pulmonary edema. Holy cow! Yeah. So extubate on an inhale is all I'm saying here. Extubate on an inhale, and you won't have to worry near as much about that type of thing. Uh, aspiration, of course, if their airways are um, swollen or they're, if they had a poor cough or gag, that can easily happen. So extubation failure usually happens within the first eight hours. So that's something that you just have to be aware of. Hey, this patient was extubated three hours ago when you're giving a report. Make sure that they know that this patient in this room was extubated and it's only been, you know, a couple of hours. Uh, usually we'll track extubations for the first 48 hours to see if they get reintubated. Uh, so let me ask you this. Hospital A has a reintubation rate of 12%. Hospital B has a reintubation rate of 2%. Which one's doing better? Which one has a much more adventitious extubation protocol? Which one is doing the right thing, right? So I have a feeling or tendency, most of you said the 2% uh, has a, a better reintubation rate, right? Only 2% of their patients need to be reintubated after being extubated. However, 12% is actually more optimized because the 12% uh, extubation failure means that they're more aggressive about getting the patients off of mechanical ventilation. They're giving the patients more of a chance. They're not having prolonged stays of ventilation and all the issues with muscle atrophy and ventilator acquired conditions and all the hemodynamic issues that can go on with it. So when you're looking at extubation failure, failure is not a failure. Failure just means we gave them a try and it didn't work out. So we'll try it again later on. So when we're looking at extubation failure, it's okay to have a reintubation rate. If, in fact, if you have your reintubation rate so incredibly low, that's a sign you're not being aggressive enough and you're actually prolonging and can be causing more harm than good. Um, so, so reintubation rates can range anywhere between 4 and 33%. I'm not going to test you on those statistics because they'll change from year to year. Uh, more common in patients who demonstrate mental status change and neurological impairment. So those are more of your your neuro uh, uh, patients. That's why so, sometimes we just go ahead and trach some of our neuro patients early on. So we don't have to reintubate. We just reconnect them. So a low reintubation rate, like 5%, might suggest we're too conservative and we might uh, not uh, give them a chance to come off. So... They have a lot of risks staying on the ventilator. Ventilator associated pneumonias or ventilator acquired conditions, ventilator induced lung injury, that means we're pushing too much, we're destroying lung tissue, and it can cause a lot of damage to their airway, long term damage too. So, a high percentage of failure over 30% means we're too aggressive there. So, there are risks associated with hypoxemia, all those other things, hypercarbia. So, there is risk of having too much there. But you need to have that sort of like 
10% range of failures to sort of be in the right area of aggressiveness. So I know it sounds wrong that you want a higher failure rate, but here, this failure rate means that we're doing the best thing for our patients. We're giving them the option to avoid all the side effects that could be going on. Reintubation is usually marked by uh, high risk for pneumonia uh, easily uh, for these patients. Uh, increase in mortality rates, uh, those are all things that we might see with patients that fail and need to get reintubated. So that just means that overall they were sick, they were healthy enough, and then they're just still not healthy quite enough to stay breathing on their own. So that means that these patients at baseline were probably pretty sick or whatever disease or condition they have is pretty bad. So the risks of a continual airway must be weighted against the risk of extubation and failure. So we're always looking at pluses and minuses of every situation in medicine. And that's one of the things that we have to look at. Uh, that's why I'm okay if we have a patient where everything else is good, but they're still an 80% and 10 of pressure, can we still extubate? And I would, I would venture to be on the aggressive side and say, as long as we have a plan in place and everything else is checked off, well, let's give it a shot, right? So we owe it to them. So remember, you don't need to have every box checked off. You just need to have the care team all agree on this. Remember, you play a very important role in this situation. So we'll get there. Up to 80% of patients who intentionally self-extubate do not require reintubation. In other words, if they are awake enough and they pull out their tube and they can scurry themselves down to the foot of the bed and grab the circuit and the tubing and pull the tube out themselves, 80% of those patients that self-extubate because they were strong enough to do that actually don't require a reintubation. That's a failure rate of 20%, right? That's an 80% success rate, right? Some of you guys would kill for an 80% on a test, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so when you're looking at this, uh, you're seeing that uh, if they're strong enough to pull that, that means they weren't being aggressive enough at extubating these patients. And that's one of the dangers is leaving someone on too long. So extubation is a friend. You just got to know the right time. You got to know that there are gray areas, but you're an integral part of this team. And then if there is gray areas, we have a plan for it. You have a plan as the RT ready to go with the care team. What drugs are on board? What plans are we going to have? Right. Then we can have a better chance at a successful extubation.